Hey, what's up, my people? John Middlecoff, new YouTube channel. What I need you to do, subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, share with your friends. Appreciate everyone that has. It's the podcast, three and out. You can listen wherever you listen to podcasts. Apple, Spotify, we got you covered. Also, thevolume.com, thevolume.com. We got merch right here, flex fit hat. Go to thevolume.com, get yourself a three and out hat. Well, we are officially under a week away till the NFL draft, but somehow Belichick has stolen a lot of headlines after the big ESPN article. And one thing I did not talk about the other day was how they are basically placing him all over the NFC East. The Eagles, I think, thought about it. The Cowboys definitely did. And then the lingering situation with the Giants and if they have another disastrous season. So we'll we'll dive into some of Belichick and just the the rumbles that are not going to go away. I mean, it's going to be one of the main talking points all off season with old William Belichick. And uh, the top of the draft, I, I wanted to dive in because the messaging from the teams, two of them have been very consistent, and then the other teams are all over the board. And then something Joe Shane said, I, I watched Adam Peters' press conference, I watched the Giants' Shane's press conference, and he's an impressive guy. But he got asked about some of the questions Eisen was kind of pushing out there about the buyer's remorse. And I, it just makes me shake my head, even though I understand that he has to be somewhat political given that Daniel Jones is still on his team. But come on. Come on, guys. And then a little uh, Fugazi Friday. As someone in my DM said they, they did a poll and they got uh, Fugazi. But I think I'm going to stick with Fugazi for the time being. Uh, until like Robert De Niro or someone like that from uh, from the Sopranos or the Godfather or whatever calls me out. I just I think Fugazi Friday has a little more pop. So we got some of those fired in the DMs. I appreciate it. But before we dive into some football, it's like, God, the draft, I, I can't wait, man. It's right around the corner. No more speculation, no more hypotheticals. I think I'm going to do a mock draft probably Wednesday. Uh, of next week so mock draft next week uh at least the top 10 i mean i'm not i'm not gonna do that in the 20s because no one has any clue including those teams but we will do a mock draft top 10 that will include trades that will include trades so we will dive into that uh coming up so so stay tuned you you guys know where to find us but before we dive in my friends close personal friends i saw they had a good ad with big cat and pft when i was watching uh I think I was watching the golf tournament today, or maybe ESPN, and it came on. Uh, love these guys. They've been loyal partners. They're the official ticketing app of this podcast because of you guys. Because you guys have hammered that promo code, John. Last night, my lady was like, let's, let's go to a concert. She was looking at She's like, you see, Luke Combs is coming to Glendale in like a month. I'm like, let me check game time. Started looking around. Got to figure out whether I'm going to go Friday or Saturday. But I'm going to use... Game time, easy to do. Type in the venue, type in the artist, type in the team. You want to go to a Yankee game? You want to go to an NBA playoff game? You want to go to an NHL hockey game? Hell, I don't even have an NHL team in my backyard anymore. They're going to Salt Lake City. You live in Salt Lake City, you want to go next year to watch your new hockey team? Do it with game time. Promo code John, $20 off at checkout. In these inflationary times, save a little money. Don't even need a thank you. Just hammer that promo code. Promo code John, save $20. I do think the Belichick conversation is pretty fascinating. I was listening to Michael Lombardi's podcast. He's been on this show before. He's fantastic. He was going off because of the situation in Atlanta and how they, you know, are run by Rich McKay, who is the executor of Arthur Blank's estate. I I definitely didn't know that until like the last week. That's pretty crazy. Like I've known a few rich people in my day. Usually, the people that run their estate are either a child or like a lawyer that they've had for decades. I know Rich McKay has worked for the Atlanta Falcons now for almost, I think, 21 years. But that's a pretty powerful thing to hold. If you have any assets, let alone have the wealth that Arthur Blank possesses, he makes his the president of his football team, the executor, like, That shows you the connection with Rich. So, like, whether the Falcons should have hired him or not, 
if Rich McKay does not like Bill Belichick and Bill Belichick does not like Rich McKay, Bill Belichick was never getting that job. The guy's the executor on his fucking estate. He controls all of his money. <laughs> like, if that guy was going to have a ton of influence, which of course he does, Bill was never coming there. And I, I think it's kind of played out that way, obviously. But, which I, I think, listen, Bill Belichick not being head coach in this league right now is crazy. I'm sorry. I stand by that. I don't apologize for that. I don't even think that's a crazy take. He should be a head coach if he wants to be a head coach. But one conversation that is going to happen nonstop, I mean nonstop, is going to be what team is he coaching in 2025. It's going to be nonstop. And we already know teams that sniffed around with him, that kept their coaches, the Eagles and the Cowboys. Let's be real. The day or two days after the Cowboys got curb stomped in that playoff game. It's one thing to lose in the playoffs. It's hard, right? You, you can lose a playoff game and be like, God, we played pretty well. Happened to the Packers. Happened to the Lions, right? It happened to the, uh, the Bills. Played pretty well against the Chiefs. Like, it happens, right? It's another thing to get mollywopped and embarrassed. And it's worse when it's at home. And that's what happened to the, to the Cowboys. So I remember being in a sauna, which at, at my gym, which I love. I, I I try to sit in the sauna like uh, three days a week, 20, 25 minutes. feel incredible, especially when you're a bald guy. You get right in the shower, shave your head, get an incredible shave. But there were two guys in there. I don't know them. And sometimes I, I if I'm going to lay down, I, I take my, my headphones in there and I'm listening to a podcast or a book on tape or whatever and just kind of lay there for 25 minutes. But I just went in there and we they were talking football. And they were like, when is Belichick? I'll never forget this. When is Belichick going to be the head coach of the Cowboys? <laughs> They, they don't know what I do for a living. I'm like, shit, by the end of the week? <laughs> I mean, it felt like a lock. And then they didn't do it. And they're going to be talk with the Eagles. And listen, by far, the most prominent teams with the most tangible pressure on them, to me, are the Eagles and the Cowboys. The difference, I'd say, with the Eagles is, I would say, between Fangio and Kellen Moore, they're paying their two coordinators, I'd say, over under $8.5 million dollars. Fangio's probably making five. Kellen's making three or four. It's great. That's just the going. That's what these guys make. So the Eagles want this to work. They want Nick Sirianni to work. And to me, if they get back into the playoffs and don't go out like chumps and win a game, like I don't think they would fire him. And the Eagles have proven to be, you know, they got rid of Doug, but they had missed the playoffs. It was pretty ugly. To me, if they're successful again, the young players start ascending. I think they will have no problem running it back kind of with this core group. Sirianni, Kellen Moore, Vic Fangio. That's what they want. I don't necessarily believe that with the Cowboys. And listen, we all kind of mocked Mike McCarthy, rightfully so, because he lied about, he had the year off, said he watched every snap, and then at the press conference, like, yeah, I actually didn't watch every snap. It's like four games. Uh, like their roster, like the Cowboys. I'm cool. But one thing he's proven, and it can't be argued, he's a good coach. He is. He wins a lot of games. Won a lot of games with the Packers. He had Aaron Rodgers. Then he goes to Dak, who's solid, but he ain't sure as hell ain't Aaron Rodgers. And they have been consistently good. They've hosted playoff games two of three years. The problem is McCarthy, the regular season means nothing now. It's, it's irrelevant. Whether he wins 10, 11, 12 games, none of it matters. He's going to be strictly judged in January. And to me, he borderline has to get him in the NFC Championship game, which they haven't been to in two and a half decades. I just can't imagine he's going to be the coach next year. And we already know that he's under his last year of his contract, which is borderline unheard of in the NFL. I think Coughlin did it years ago with the Giants, and obviously he lost his job. So to me, if the Cowboys aren't super successful in the playoffs, and let's face it, based on their offseason, like, they've lost players because of their cap situation. They had to get rid of productive guys. They also lost their defensive coordinator, who, while the season ended poorly for Dan Quinn, I think we all agree Dan Quinn was a big addition to Mike McCarthy's success the last two or three years in the regular season. So do they come back to earth a little bit in the regular season, that meaning they got to go on the road if they can't win the division? You would assume the division is a little better now that, you know, who knows, Washington could be a little spicier. We, we know the Eagles and them play really tough games. I, I just think that makes the most sense even though people are like, oh, Bill and Jerry, the power, like, Bill's going to be 74 years old. That's what I want to happen. And then let's face it, the curveball, and we'll talk, talk about the Giants and their situation a little bit later, is them. 
Belichick became a household name for sports fans in the 80s when he was the brains behind the motivation of Parcells with the Giants. And clearly, if you've ever watched the two Bills, that organization he has a special place for. He hates the Jets. He wouldn't piss on every player on the Jets if they were on fire in his front yard. He despises that organization. But it feels like he loves the Giants. And one thing with Bill, and I, I'm sure we'll see this, I clearly like Pat knows we can't really ask about the craft situation. Bill probably doesn't want to discuss that publicly. But that thing's getting really ugly. It, it really is. And even though everyone has Bill's back, in the Boston market, all the players. Bill's wired to be like double FU mode. That's how he's been with some of their big scandals, right? The Flate Gate, uh, Spy Gate, he comes out guns blazing. And I can't imagine he will do whatever it takes to be head coach in the league next year. And time sometimes, I would say, shakes the negativity around him because the team wasn't very good this year. Quarterback was a joke, and Mac Jones was on the team because of Belichick. But their defense was good, and their kicker was terrible, which he drafted. But I, I, I just think that I saw it forever with Gruden, and I, and I was fooled. I really was because when Gruden interviewed forever, or was like putting his hat in the ring for all those jobs, college and pro, you're like, God, I'd be all over John Gruden. John, you can get John Gruden, and then he came back and you're like, yeah. Not quite what I expected. But then you look back, how successful was he the last four or five years in the NFL? Not really. So I, I, I think Bill is going to be constantly connected to these NFC East teams, and that's fun. Like, sometimes I think hypotheticals can get out of control. To me, there's substance behind this. There's reality behind this. And it's just going to be something that we continue to talk about, especially with the Cowboys, if this season just goes a little rocky. They, they already are in a weird situation with the quarterback and what they're going to do. Are they going to finally extend them? Are they just going to play it out? I don't know. Uh, but I, I think the Cowboys, to me, would be the number one. If I had to rank them, you know, if you told me all three teams have shitty years, which I guess is possible, you can have a bad team win a division 7-9, I would go Cowboys, Giants, Eagles in the ranking of Bill Belichick landing next year. The 82 game preseason is in the books and it's finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JOHN. New customers bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code J-O-H-N, JOHN, only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. One thing that has, you know, following these top teams and the messaging coming out of them that's been pretty interesting is the Bears never wavered, right? My mom could have told you they're taking Caleb Williams three months ago. Some people still like, I'd go with Justin Fields. Make it work. Give him a chance. And the Bears are like, yeah, we're sending him to uh, the Steelers for a six-round pick. See ya. And the conversation, even for those little radicals that wanted Fields to somehow survive, were completely muted, and we all agreed. Like, everyone knows. So we don't even talk about that much. There's nothing to talk about. Honestly, the only conversation with the Bears is what they're going to do with the ninth pick. But the messaging coming out, they don't even need to message Caleb's taken one visit, and it was to Chicago. I mean, he's going to be a Chicago Bear. Now, once you get to two, Adam Peters, I don't want to say has been as a steadfast in terms of like the Bears left n no doubt, but he has definitely let it be known, like, yeah, we're not really open for business. We feel pretty confident at this pick. Now, we don't exactly know who he's going to pick. Most people, and the betting odds would say Jaden Daniels. I wouldn't bet my life savings on it, but... When people ask me and when I ask people, Jaden Daniels, Jaden Daniels, everyone says Jaden Daniels. So I think it's fair to assume Jaden Daniels. I wouldn't like fall out of my chair if another name pops up next Thursday, but they're going to pick a quarterback, right? We know that. We just don't know exactly 100% sure who it's going to be. 
But the other teams have not been like that. Elliot Wolf said today, longtime executive, doesn't even have the GM title. Not quite sure what the crafts are doing. Honestly, not quite sure. Just name the guy the fucking GM. I don't care if it's like, well, he actually has all the duties. Have the balls to name him the GM. I, I don't understand, separate from all the stuff with Bill and the production company, why are you guys being so weird with this? You have a first-time head coach, just make Elliot Wolf the GM. Are you, like, giving him a year trial run? He said we're open for business. And then it kind of hit me today. If I'm the Crafts, Jonathan and Bob, and I am getting destroyed locally. I mean destroyed. I have heard everywhere I look on the internet, Boston people, I played golf with a guy like three weeks ago from Boston. Everyone I've talked to or listened to say they he's getting crushed because it's clear, like, listen, it's time to break up, whatever. You, you don't need to, like, piss on the guy's grave. What do you? Why are you trying to get all that? Why are you doing this? Well, what's the easiest way to make that negativity kind of be silenced? Because if they trade back, it's like, oh, they added two first-round picks and they got all these players, no one will care. No one gives a shit when you draft an offensive lineman until that guy becomes a star offensive lineman. But you take a quarterback, you take Drake May or you take J.J. McCarthy with the third overall pick, we stop talking about how cheap the crafts are, how shitty they've handled this situation, how just what egomaniac and control freaks they've become since Bill left. We just start talking about how good is J.J. McCarthy or Drake May or Jaden Daniels going to be on their team. Takes all the oxygen out of that conversation. So even if Elliot Wolf wanted to trade back, one, he has no equity with the franchise in terms of, you know, he's never made a pick before for them. Two, he's not even technically the general manager. And three, if you're the crafts, like, take whoever you like the most at that position right there. We want you to do that. Bill might say, yeah, we're not doing that. And Bill would have traded back. Bill would have done whatever he wanted to do. Elliot Wolf can't. He just won't be allowed to. So even if the front office and the coaching staff was like, you know, given our roster, like, let's take a deep breath. I don't even think it will be an option because the ownership will never allow it because it's the easiest way to have everyone stop talking about how poorly they've handled everything. The Giants. You know, Rich Eisen said, I, I see all his clips on YouTube. He's got, I think he's got a radio show, TV show. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but I, I follow his stuff on YouTube. And one thing he said, like less than a week, maybe a couple days after the combine, obviously he's there for a week calling it with DJ, is that one of the main buzz scuttlebutt he had heard is how much the Giants had buyer's remorse on Daniel Jones, which everyone's like, yeah, no shit. And Joe Shane today at the press conference was basically asked about that. And he said, none of it was true. Now, before I dive into my thoughts on this, I understand where he's sitting. Regardless how you actually feel, even if you're like, you know, I, I never actually wanted to sign this contract. I was forced to by the ownership. We were lukewarm on the guy, even day ball. Like we, we would have been cool with letting him test free agency. John Mara forced us on my hand. He can't say that even if he was on board with the signing and was like, listen, short-term deal, $80 million sounds a lot to 99.9% .9 of people, NFL world, couple years, move on, no, no biggie. We don't really like him anymore. We'll find another quarterback. We plan on trading up in this draft. He can't say that either. So he, he's in a position where he can't really tell the truth. But let me tell the truth for him. They 100% ownership, coach, GM have buyer's remorse. If they could do it over, under no circumstances, would they have signed that contract? I'm actually confident enough they wouldn't have signed him to do any contract. They would have just let him walk. Information changes. You can love your wife or love your girlfriend, and then all of a sudden you found out she cheated on you with three different men. Changes the equation. You're in business with a partner. You're all making a lot of money. You're getting paid. And then you find out he's stealing. Your opinion of that individual changes. With more information, we think differently. Like, listen, they were bullish on Daniel Jones. First year, win some games. And now he's also injured. Like, obviously you don't know he's going to be injured, but sitting here today, he had a torn ACL. Played like shit, torn ACL. Makes a lot of money. Pretty bad combination. 
So this notion that they don't have buyer's remorse is just a bold-faced lie. It's just impossible for that not to be true. And there's nothing wrong. We all make poor decisions. All of us. I know I own a stock right now. It's an ETF, clean energy ETF. I've invested well over 100 grand into it. Right now, when I open up my account, it says about $40,000. Now, ultimately, big picture, I, I still believe in the space. But do I regret investing my money into that stock? Of course I do. I would much rather have put it into Netflix or put it into just anything else but that. Even if I like still, and I have more belief in that situation than I'm sure the Giants do. But why do I? I, I believed in it two years ago when it was working and going up. Things change. I, I never understand people who are so beholden to the way they thought a year ago, three years ago, eight years ago. It's like it's 2024, April 18th, I'm recording this. We have the information up to this point. You might feel some way right now. Well, April 18th, 2027, if things dramatically change about whatever you're thinking about, you're probably not going to think that way anymore. I hope you wouldn't, because if you still did, you'd probably have some issues. You know, people ask me all the time, like, what are your career goals? Do you want to be on television? I don't know. I mean, is YouTube bigger than television right now? I'd say for most people I know, it is. You know, things change at dramatic speeds. I don't know. I'll just do whatever I have to do. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Wherever things are going, that's where you go. I, I saw a lot of people when I first got into radio, I was around so many of these newspaper guys. I saw a guy recently on, on, on X that was like, the best advice for anyone in sports media still is to start at a newspaper. And listen, I'm not into like talking shit on Twitter as much anymore. I don't care. That's, it was the dumbest thing I'd ever read. I'm like, this guy's actually putting this out there. Yeah, if this was 2001, maybe that's pretty good advice. It's 2024. That'd be the last thing I would advise to any young person. Unless it's like the Wall Street Journal. Do not fucking do that. So signing quarterbacks is complicated. Signing the great quarterbacks is relatively easy, even though it's complicated because of the amount of money, as in like Lamar Jackson. We all knew he was good, and it was still complicated, right? Patrick Mahomes was pretty easy. Josh Allen was pretty easy. Even the Herbert thing, like there's pressure for him to be a consistent top five quarterback. Trevor Lawrence has not been paid yet. Like we need to see a little more before, before we give you $180, $200 million. It's a big financial decision. So $80 million is not $200 million, but you could argue after 15 touchdowns, they even deserve $80 million. But there is no way to spin it. They have buyer's remorse. And there's nothing wrong with that. eBay Motors is here for the ride. You know, the first car I ever got, I was 16 years old. And my grandpa gave me a ride. And like any young lad, who got a car that, let's face it, would not have been my first choice, I had to touch it up a little bit. And we tinted out the windows. We added a big subwoofer to the back. And you could hear me from miles away coming home. My, my parents sure loved me for that one. So did my neighbors. But I, I think the key to any young person getting a car is to personalize a little bit. Because you're probably not going to get your dream car. And as you get older, you know, you kind of become a car person or you don't. But you definitely have preferences, right? Some of us like bigger cars. I know I do. I've only had big cars, SUVs. And uh, there are certain non-negotiables. I just like, I like three rows of seats. Now, ideally, I don't have kids right now, so I take out that third row of seat and I like a big, you know, I like a lot of trunk room. Some people, you know, don't like SUVs, like smaller cars. I, I've never been that big since my high school car of tinting the windows. I don't care if you see me or not, but I know some people like the first thing they do is tint the windows. It's crazy. The older you get, you know, I, I had to have the subwoofers. I, I The subwoofer, I couldn't listen to music for five minutes with the subwoofer like I did when I was younger. But th there is something very, very special about that first car. I don't care how many cars you get since, how much money you make to get sweeter cars. You never quite forget that first ride and uh, some of the memorable moments that you had in it in your high school years. 
So with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay guaranteed fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Let's dive into Fugazi Friday. And a lot of you guys are now doing most of the work because I just get I get DMs. And I was like, yeah, I, I haven't seen a big Fugazi lately. A, lo a lot of you guys that hit me up about uh, my, my Tahoe and I got one of those plug-in things. Yeah, it works okay. I actually had someone from Chevrolet reach out, listener of the show, Jeff. Uh, hopefully, you know, we something materializes. We, you know, <laughs> welcome to the show. We do a lot of business here. So uh, Chevy, arms wide open, as my guys at Creed would say. Uh, let's start with this. I think this position assignment in the NFL and how it leads to contracts is somewhat of a fugazi. Why wouldn't Kelsey's agent identify him as a wide receiver? Bowers, too. I think they need to do positional groups opposed to specific positions. Quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, O-line, D-line, ETC. With the amount of scheming and utilizing players in multiple positions with different formations, I think the current model is outdated and they need to revamp considering its direct impact on the cap, player contracts, and franchises. Totally agree. Would not be opposed to that. And I'm not exactly pro-agent here, but I think it makes a lot of sense. Travis Kelsey is a wide receiver. The problem is the way the situation is constructed. Jimmy Graham was too. And he tried to argue and he lost. So it gets too complicated where you just, it's not worth arguing over something. You will not win. And like in real estate, it's all just comps on your position. Even though Travis Kelsey would say, Who's my comp? I catch 100 balls a year. I'm the greatest receiving tight end of all time because I'm a fucking wide receiver. But that's not the way it works. Micah Parsons. Like, hey, Nick Bose is a defensive end. He just got $120 million guaranteed. I am not an outside linebacker. I'm a pass rusher. Just like TJ, just like Bosa, and just like Miles Garrett. I am a pass rusher. Pass catching tight ends and pass rushers get screwed. One thousand percent totally with you this is a fugazi friday a couple months ago my wife and i had vrbo booked for a trip to miami taking a little weekend in the sun less than a week before our stay we get a notification from the owner that they sold the place and a reservation was canceled while they did technically refund us so you got refunded it was extremely frustrating no alternatives and the rebooking was on us to figure it out if it were the other way around and we canceled for any reason, we would have lost our payment due to the terms. But since the owner cancels, they don't have any repercussions. What the? Fugazi. I think there's a simple solution to this. And I, I, I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest VRBO, Airbnb. Like, I, I never set that up. Whenever I'm at one, it's always through someone else. Maybe I'm living in the past, still more of a hotel guy when I travel. Maybe that will change with time. Build a family. Obviously, it's much easier. Uh, maybe I'm just living in the past. Maybe I should get into that game a little more. If your house, I don't think it's crazy, right? I put my house on VRBO, Airbnb. Some guy no it knocks on my door, calls me up and says, makes me an offer I can't refuse. I sell the house. If my house is for sale or is pending a sale and I'm doing this, there should be some sort of situation that VRBO or these companies help you facilitate a new place, right? To me, if it's something that just happens overnight, which I, it's hard for a purchase to happen overnight, so they would have known, that to me is another step of like, okay, my house is on the market. I'm just VRBOing it out. I know at any moment it could be sold. And then people with reservations, especially in a place, Miami, Scottsdale, right? San Diego, Vegas, New Orleans. I mean, there are certain travel destinations here. 
uh, that are going to be pretty highly impacted when a house sells. So I, I would say, yeah, I, I understand your frustrations. And this is easily avoidable, right? Especially if the house had been for sale for a while. Fugazi Friday. Fast food. Fast food has always been terrible for you, but it was convenient enough and cheap enough to justify, justify sacrificing some health every now and then. Agreed. However, in the post-COVID world, outside of the real estate market, it seems like there is no industry that has taken advantage of inflation white like American fast food. I used to be able to go to BK, that'd be Burger King, McDonald's or Taco Bell, and grab a lunch for six, seven dollars. It's almost impossible to find anywhere, much less some already more expensive brands, and not walk out paying less than $15. I ordered four burgers and two orders of fries from one fast food joint. No drinks, $62. Service is suffered at many of the change, yet the drive throughs are still 20 minutes deep for God knows what burger, and they nearly cost what you can get ordered fresh at a sit-down restaurant. I'll never forget being a kid. You go to Taco Bell and eat like a king with a $5 bill. Eat like a king. McDonald's used to have pretty good meals for under 5 bucks. Uh, Burger King definitely had a good 99 cent menu. So did Wendy's. I don't eat fast food as much anymore. I, I would say this, and I always notice this because we go to in and out probably once a month, maybe twice a month. That is easily the best bang for your buck. You can get a shitload of food to feed four people for 30 bucks. You can eat like a King for two people for under 20. So I'm talking triple triples, animal style fries, milkshakes, I just think that these companies, I don't know where you live, but obviously in California now, minimum wage, 20 bucks. So as all this stuff goes up, the, the price, like they pass it on to us, right? That, that's always, hey guys, it's why the government is always so out of touch. Like cost gets passed on. Welcome to, I don't know, the business world. So all their stuff, you know, I, I don't know where McDonald's or Burger King gets their meat, but that's more expensive. Everything's more expensive. So as that gets more expensive, labor gets more expensive. The McDonald's, I think, owns their real estate, but some of these other companies maybe lease out a bit, you know, land. That gets more expensive. It just drives up. But I'm with you. It's hard to justify. I also think we need to think about this differently because in the history of the world, like the dollar doesn't come back down in terms of, you know, remember when a burger was $28 and then it came down to $15, it's not usually the way it works. In my 39 years of life, things have steadily risen. Car prices, clothes, food, you name it, right? Like this is the reality. And I think for any, I don't know how old you are, but we used to look at $20 or $1,000 or $100. You have it in your head what that means. Well, it doesn't mean that anymore which sucks. I'm not, it just sucks. It was out of our control, but kind of is what it is. So I, I think you should just boycott the fast foods. I still think you go to Taco Bell. I haven't been there in a while, but beating cheese burrito, some just regular tacos, even chicken soft tacos. My buyer to Taco Bell is usually a bean and cheese burrito. Uh, if I'm feeling fat, probably two chicken soft tacos, Supremes. And maybe like a chicken burrito. That's if I'm feeling fat. If I just want to stay healthy just and I need a little snack, two chicken soft tacos, boom, a little mild sauce, off and running. That, that's really the only fast food. I, I, I would do McDonald's for breakfast, but my body, and I, I, I'm someone in my teens and early 20s, like I'm sure a lot of guys ate a lot of fast food. I just, I, I'll be 250 pounds. And like you said, it's not like you're getting some deal. It's not like, hey, you know, I didn't pay anything. Double inflation, Fugazi Friday. Companies that are charging more and giving less. I'd rather pay additionally for same product and not have the quality reduction. My dog treats recently started charging more, and now the treats are roughly 50% smaller, cut in half horizontally. All this does for the consumer is make them hate the brand, and I have sworn off dozens of companies doing this and making my own dog treats. Fuck companies who don't respect their consumer. Yeah, I don't know what else to say. Having a dog, not cheap, especially bigger dogs. 
food's not cheap. They eat a lot. Uh, we, we always had labs in my house and they eat a lot. Good thing is, you know, certain dogs make them an egg here and there, feed them some chicken. But I hear you. You know, the reason Amazon, I mean, started to run circles around people, customer service. You could send anything back. Delivery was free. Customer, customer, customer. Any person listening to this as just someone who consumes a lot, when you're customer friendly, that loyalty, even if in my generation we're less loyal than my parents' generation, it does still mean something. It, it really does. Shitty customer service is always the easiest way. You better have an elite product. It's like a player. It's like, well, he's a pro bowler. Yeah, he's been arrested a few times. Well, he's still a pro bowler. You're not a pro bowler and you're getting arrested. See ya, you're cut. All right? It's like, yeah, the food's elite. Customer service sucks. You're like, yeah, I'm still eat there. It's like, oh, yeah, your product's okay and your customer service sucks. Peace. Because it's never been easier to find other options, right? Got this little thing called the internet. Lakers basketball is a fugazi. First time watching a Laker game all year. And the end of the game is just give the ball to AD. Then they have a foul. AD shoots free throws. Lakers win on AD free throws. I think the Lakers, I heard on a podcast earlier this year, were like setting a record for most free throws in a year. Uh, I mean, the, the Lakers won that game because Zion got hurt. They were going to lose. Zion was dominating. Luckily, we get to watch the Lakers lose to the Denver Nuggets, who are going to kick the shit out of them. They've got, I'd say, five. I'll give the Lakers a a courtesy game. Adios, LeBron. Adios, Steph. <laughs> Adios, NBA television ratings. When you're two most famous players, one gets knocked out in the 9-10 and the other gets knocked out in the first round, it's going to be rough for business, you know? I I, I like playoff stuff, but... If you think I'm watching Kings OKC, you got another thing coming. Bugazi Friday, the market for NFL quarterbacks. I'm a Dolphins fan, and the big topic this offseason for fans on Dolphins podcast is obviously to his extension. Everyone keeps bringing up the quarterback market and that you can't offer a guy like Tua $30 million a year because the market dictates that he should make more like $55 million. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. They claim this is why Daniel Jones' contract happened among other dumb quarterback contracts. The quote-unquote market is such a fugazi. If you put two on the open market, there is no shot that a team would pay him more than $30 million. I, I never quite understand this either. Because Daniel Jones and, and even Tua, you're not afraid to lose them. Like, what drives up a price for a player is like, he has leverage. If so, if Justin Jefferson hit the open market, if Nick Bosa or TJ Watt hit the open market, like, you know, people would be lined up. 20 teams, the good teams and the bad team. No, everyone would try to sign the guy. Okay, it's like, yeah, here's our offer. Three years, $80 million. We'll guarantee 80. We'll guarantee the whole thing. But this is your offer. It's like, no, what the disrespect. Okay, play this year out, hit free agency and see what happens. If you play so well this year, maybe we'll up the offer. I, I never quite understand that with these middle-tier quarterbacks. I, I, I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. Baseball's all out of whack just in terms of guys signing right before the regular season. They're free agents. They, their business model's fucked up. But one thing that's come back to earth is like, yeah, Otani's worth 700 Mookie's worth 400 Most of you guys are worth like 100 and some of these outrageous contracts have definitely slowed down. And it's just healthier. It's like, yeah, not everyone's worth this. The NBA is obviously all out of whack. They max out everybody. But the NFL has that problem at quarterback. Like, yeah, Lamar, Mahomes, Allen. I I'm sorry, like, what's two of the 14th best quarterback in the NFL? Here's $28 million a year for three years. If you improve, we'll bump that number up. We like you. Someone's going to pay you? Yeah, someone would pay us. That was what his agent would say. Okay, go play for them for $45 million. Good luck to that fucking team. Godspeed. I'm with you. I, I, I never have understood that. We, we've seen it happen with Dak. We saw it happen with Dak a couple years ago. Uh, feels like we're going to see it with Tua this year. Be interesting what happens with Dak again. I, I just don't get like a more manageable number, how there's not a gap, right? Because there is a gap in terms of the play. 
So if there's a gap in terms of the play, shouldn't there be a cap in terms of the compensation? If one of my sales guys is bringing in $10 million a year and the other sales guy is bringing in $2 million a year, who do you think is making more in bonuses? Right? It's like, well, one guy's just way better than the other guy by every metric. The eye test, playoffs, like it's not even debatable. I don't get it. Never have, never will, to be honest with you. 